I'm Stacey and welcome back to my YouTube channel. We've talked about combinatorial logic a lot and we've talked about the clock and how the clock works in the FPGA but there's one critical missing piece in this whole business and that is what do we do if we've got to remember a signal for use later like say for example as there's a bus and it has a value and we want to store that later we want to say hey wait I want to keep you I want to keep you for later so that I can use you down the line how do I do that and that is one of the roles of the synchronous process so I'm going to be showing you an example what a synchronous always block is and why is it different from an asynchronous always block and how we can use them inside the FPGA to create what we need as far as memory and storing values and stuff like that so I've got a really simple example and I'm going to be opening it up in Vivado because it's pointless me giving you the code and then you don't know how to use it and run it yourself and play with it. So I'm just going to start by going to tools, run tickle script, LFSR for bit and click go. And it's going to execute the tickle script and reproduce the project based on what's in the script. I usually go to the tickle console here and I check that there's no errors and there aren't any. So on the left hand side here, you can see that this is the workflow and generally you start at the top left and you work your way down. So I've already added sources to this project and you can see here is my top level linear feedback shift register. And I'm actually going to open it in Emacs because Emacs is bigger <laughs> and easier to manage. So in this example, I have both kinds of always blocks. I've got a synchronous one and an asynchronous one. So we're going to start with the asynchronous one and you can see the difference is that this one has a clock in the sensitivity list and you don't have to worry about the sensitivity list at all. You just have to see does it have a clock or doesn't have a clock, right? And if it does have a clock then you know it's synchronous and if it doesn't have a clock like this one just has an asterisk then it's async. The asynchronous one which is this guy over here it's just more space for combinatorial logic. So it's exactly the same as this assign, right? That code and that code are identical functionally. They'll produce the same circuit. They're both just combinatorial logic. The asynchronous always block, which is the one with the star, just gives you more space. That's all it does. There are a couple of things to remember about asynchronous always blocks. The one is that everything that you fit within this always block needs to be done in one clock cycle. So if you have lots of stuff, there might not be enough time because in the FPGA, the signals have a time that it takes for them to propagate through the circuitry. Each little circuit element has a propagation time and those times add up. If you are doing a lot of cases and a lot of if statements and a lot of ands and ors and gates that are combinatorial logic, you could have logic doesn't fit within a clock cycle. It can be difficult to know, like how much is enough, how much is too much. So the general rule of thumb that I use is if your signals are short and if you're not doing any multiplies, you can get away with quite a lot. Like you could put a whole state machine in here. But if your signals are more than 16 bits up to 32, 64 bits, if you're using longer signals, or if you're doing a multiply or lots of additions and the increments answer that, but lots of additions of two signals together, especially long signal additions or long signal multiplications, those can add up. When you start finding yourself using lots of multiplies and lots of additions, in your code, you want to start looking at using synchronous always blocks instead. Future Stacy here, I just wanted to add in one really, really important thing as well. When you're doing an asynchronous always block, you need to make sure that every single statement has a default case or has an else. So if else, case default, every single thing needs to have an else or a default statement because otherwise that infers hacky memory in your asynchronous always block. If you want memory, you do a synchronous always block because it's made for memory. If you do hacky memory inside an asynchronous always block, which is an inferred latch, you're just going to get hacky unreliable memory. You can accidentally make memory inside an asynchronous always block by inferring a latch and that is done by leaving out a default case or an else statement, that's really bad practice. The other thing that you will notice is that these have 
uh, normal equal sign. When we go to the synchronous words block, we will see that this has got an arrow and an equal sign. So the normal equal sign is a blocking assignment and the synchronous words block has got a non-blocking assignment. So the basic summary is the asynchronous always block has a, an asterisk, is purely like combinatorial logic, and you use the equal sign. And for a beginner, that's all you need to know. So a synchronous always block is used in a couple of different cases. The one case is when you are doing a big combinatorial task, like a multiply, and um, the combinatorial logic that you have doesn't fit into one clock cycle and you need to split it up over multiple clock cycles. And the way that you would do that is you would write your logic in a synchronous always block. When it generates the circuitry for the synchronous always block, all of the signals will be registered at the end. So this is useful if you do a multiply, then it automatically sticks a register on the end. Um, so that's the one case where you would use a synchronous always block. The other case that you would use a synchronous voice block is as a memory element because you want to store your signal for later. It's like, hey, actually, I don't need you right now. I actually need you a bit later. So just hang on and then come back next clock cycle. And that is what you use a synchronous voice block for. And that's what this linear feedback shift register does. I will show you what the waveform looks like. But basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be delaying a signal four times. Bit two drives bit three, and then bit one drives bit two, and then bit zero drives bit one, and then this formula drives bit zero. So it's like, okay, I'm going to take the signal and I'm going to hold it off to next clock cycle, and then it's going to have that value. And so that is how we have a memory element inside the FPGA. So the other thing I want to mention, these always blocks or these processes can be anywhere in the file. So it doesn't matter what order they're in. The only important thing is that the signal declaration happens above where it's used. And that's just because of the synthesis tool passing the file from top to bottom. But in terms of where these always blocks are, they're like their own little floating islands of code. They just like can float around. You can put them anywhere you like. You could rearrange them as you like. And so you don't have to worry about the order of them. So I'm going to run the simulation and it's, I just go run simulation. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see the linear feedback shift register is going to be delayed four times each time by one clock cycle. So now I've opened the simulation and I'm just going to run it for 200 milliseconds and then we can zoom out and see what it looks like. And so if we zoom in over here, we can see that our registers or our signals are delayed by four. And time goes on towards the right. So this the end. This is the most recent simulation. Bit zero is the newest data. And then bit one is the data delayed by one. And bit two is the zero delayed by two and three is zero delayed by three. So we have a history of what bit zero looked like in the past for four clock cycles. And the way that we do that is in this code over here, where we say bit zero drives bit one next clock cycle. And then what was bit one becomes bit two next clock cycle. And what was bit two becomes bit three next clock cycle. And so in the synchronous always block, everything is done next clock cycle. And that's how we produce this delayed output where we say, hold on, I want to keep you and put you next clock cycle so that I can use you later. And so what this linear feedback shift register does is it's like this little pseudo random number algorithm where you take two bits in this case of your history. You've got your history of four, which is zero, one, two, three, and you take history bit three and history bit two and you exclusive all them together and you make that your new bit zero and then it generates a, a pseudo random number that goes through every single value of four bits except zero the all zero case so it's 15 numbers that it iterates through 
and this is quite useful if you want to throw something into a test bench to check your code easily if you need some quick and dirty data generator it's not the greatest for like proper verification but it is useful if you just want to throw some data into your code as a challenge what you can do is you can extend it if you want to try and make this into an 8-bit linear feedback shift register i will have in the description the link to the paper and you can see if you can figure out how to do an 8-bit so the rules for this synchronous always block are that it must be arrow equals and the clock in the top line in the sensitivity list and no other signals and then you'll be good and that's about it i think i'm going to wrap that up for today it is a i think it's going to be a bit of a longer one but i appreciate you and thanks for watching my video and i hope that this sheds some light on it always block so there's a link in the description to the xilinx paper and to a google feedback form and to this github repo that has the example project i appreciate you thank you for watching